All right. So here we are. We were left with uh, this equation, so we went through just a very fast recap of GR, so our lambda CDM uh, model, and we arrived uh, at the uh, Friedman equation, which was written in terms of the Hubble function. So we have the Hubble function, which is characterized by the ingredients that, that define the dynamics of the universe, among which we have a uh, matter, which could be, in this case, non-relativistic, uh, non and it's called. We have a relativistic species, among which photons and neutrinos as well. And later on in these lectures, we are also going to treat uh, neutrinos and see what they do to structure formation and to the evolution of uh, galaxy clusters, for example, the filamentary structures and so on. Our cosmological constants, which we could associate on energy density, and uh, the a curvature term. Okay. Now it is definition, so these omegas are coming up, it's just are just definitions. That's the density contrast, where we have the density of the species that we are discussing about, so matter, density, or whatever, divided with respect to the density, the critical density, which is this one. It is defined in this way. And that's the density for which the curvature is equal to zero. Okay? So we can just get our Friedman equation, we get omega to the power of 2 on the other side. And what we get is this expression in which we see that whenever we get k equal to 0, that's the density we get. Omega curvature would mean equal to 0 because that's proportional to k. So that's omega k is equal to 0, obviously, which implies omega total equal to 1. Okay, so that's the condition for which we have our flat geometry. Now, during the lectures, I'm going to keep k equal to zero, curvature equal to zero, for simplicity, because then equations simplify us a lot. And uh, by using, uh, by defining basically the conformal time that I introduced during the first lecture, it's, it's extremely convenient because we would just have a, basically a Minkowski-like metric, so a flat geometry, and all terms are multiplied by eight to the power of two. Okay, and the Minkowski metric is sort of special in the sense that the time is changing as a function of the uh, Hubble, uh, of, of the, of the, uh, of the um, expansion rate, A. Okay, so the time is conformal, but formally it gets the, all equations looks like in Minkowski space, except for the A factor in front of it, A to the power of two in front of it. Okay, so, and why am I going to do that? Well, for this simplicity reason, because uh, equations are going, since we're going to uh, use more advanced uh, uh, features with respect to dark energy and so on, with respect to what we have done during the first lectures in cosmology, things will become extremely complicated, overcomplicated, and we will not gain much because observations basically tell us that the curvature of the universe is zero or nearly zero. Okay? So, yeah, it's a restrictive case, but uh, it makes sense because the universe looks like it has a flat geometry. Okay? That's what we are going to do. Good. So, that's it about uh, this uh, introduction. But, well, I can just tell you, give you a few, few numbers. So, basically, we say we see that uh, omega matter, so the component associated to variance and dark energy, is of, of the order of 0.25%, so density contrast 0.25. Omega radiation, I'm talking about photon, is much smaller than one. So these are the values at today. So these are today's values. So they are much smaller than zero, so negligible. We are in a matter and cosmological constant domination now, and omega lambda is about 70%, uh, uh, okay? So the order of 70%, so 0 0.7, okay? 7.75, I mean, depends to, to whom you ask, okay? So here I'm kind of losing these values. We are getting at the precision of, I would say, 5% with respect to these values. These are from observational constraints. And uh, according to the way you are measuring your 
values here, two cosmological observations, as we are going to go through again during this lecture in more details, uh, that's the precision you get. So according to the different surveys, you also get there are also some few tension uh, going on. Okay. Good. Well, then H not H not uh, is roughly um, it's roughly seven hundred seventy. Okay. Kilometers per hour over uh, kilograms. Good. So that's what we have. That's our beloved lambda CDM model. Now we got, uh, I gave you when deriving these uh, equations, we have also realized the fact that uh, we can define an equation of state. Okay, well, actually, in general, we can define an equation of state which is parametric. And it's written in this way where the parameter w depends on the sort of materials or matter or components that we are considering. And for radiation, I showed you last time we have one term. Actually, for relativistic species in general, that's equal to one third. That's true for neutrinos and photons. For matter, since we're dealing with no relativistic matter, it's going to be considered as pressureless. Okay? That's equal to zero. So for dark matter, dark matter, we are going to use equal to zero. If you are considering photons, that's an approximation. Because photons, uh, sorry, photons, variants, so omega b is different than zero, but that's relevant on small scales. Okay? On extremely large scales, one can neglect the pressure of, of, uh, of variants. Okay? On small scales. Okay? On large scales, we can use the approximation of dust. And that's completely fine if we are describing the dynamic of the universe. Okay? If we are going to st study things related to structure formation, then we must keep in mind that. Okay. You remember the power spectrum, how it depends on the pressure of variance. You remember the features that are visible in the cosmic micro background power spectrum. They depends on the pressure of variance. Okay, so not is negligible on large scales, but not uh, on small scales. So let's give a, a better look at uh, these differences from where it is uh, uh, W equal to one third for radiation, for radiation species, WM equal to zero for non-relativistic particles. Let's give a look at that, okay? So, the ingredients of our universe. So, as we said, we are going to have relativistic species. We are going to have non-relativistic species. And we are going to have scalar fields. Okay. Scalar fields, because in the course of the lectures, what we are going to do is to try to set our below cosmological constant equal to zero and introduce dark energy. Okay, which can be well described with a scalar field, right? Quintessence. So we are going through a quintessence model. And then we are going to see how various quintessence models exist, what are the solutions, what is the dynamic that it creates, how you can transition from a matter domination to a, so to a radiation domination to a matter domination and to a lambda domination regime. Okay, so we're going to see how this is uh, happening. Good. Then, how are these species described? So let's take these two guys, so relativistic and non-relativistic particles. Let's leave the scalar fields aside for a moment. Well, they are described through the phase space distribution, right? Phase space distribution, F. That's 
in the phase space. You know, you have like a, it's a six-dimensional space, uh, which is a, which contains the position and the momentum of particles. Okay, so that's our six-dimensional space, which is our phase space. Okay, the distribution of particles. You know, it's given by the Fermi Dirac and the Bose-Einstein distributions. It depends, in general, by the position and the momentum of particles. I guess what? What are we considering here? A universe which is homogeneous and isotropic. And therefore, the dependency with respect to the position is negligible, because the phase space distribution in this location or in any other location is the same. Okay? So we have only a dependency based on the momentum of the particles. And the, our distribution reads like that, plus minus one, where we have the plus sign for the uh, fermions. So we have the Fermi Dirac distribution. And the minus is for the Bose Einstein distribution. Okay? The distinction between the two relies on the fact on how the different cells in our ferry space can be occupied. So that's the occupation number, which can depend, which can, you know, is forced or not by the Pauli's exclusion principle. Okay, if there is no power exclusion principle, then we can have any state, any number of, um, so in, in a cell of a specific cell of our sp phase space, we can have a n, whatever, one, two, three thousand or millions of particles at the same, at the same level. And then we have our bosons, and by, by Bose, that, that's the Bose Einstein distribution that, that, uh, that uh, follows. Okay. Good. Out of this distribution, we can derive the density. Ha! Huh. That's relevant because the density tells you how these omegas are behaving in our free function. As well, we can get the pressure, the pressure that characterizes your equation of state, W, equation of state parameter. So we have uh, the density is proportional to uh, a number that depends on the internal degrees of freedom of your particle. And then we are integrating over the phase space distribution. Because the momentum of the phase space distribution, where we have that the, the energy density, that's actually an energy density, is going to be proportional to this quantity. Okay? So this gives you how many particles we have in a certain phase space cell, phase space cells, which is associated to a certain energy. So that's just an integral with respect to the energy weighted by the phase space distribution, and you get the energy density of your fluid. Same goes for the pressure. Again, we have our internal degrees of, great degrees of freedom. We are integrating with respect to the cells in momentum of our phase space distribution. And uh, in this case, we oh yeah, have this expression. Uh, okay. But basically, this factor here tells you what is, uh, the, what is the number of, the, of, uh, of cells that you have, uh, the number of phase elements that you have in your space distribution. Okay? So we have rho and phi that are coming out of that. Okay. Yeah? Uh, the only difference between the pressure and the yeah. and the and the and the and the three? Yes, and the 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 Good, otherwise we, we never end up, we never end the, the, the recap. Good. Now that you have uh, 
these distributions, okay? So you see that uh, I'm not making some matrix here, even though the phase space is distribution because I'm assuming that we have, uh, we are going in the continuous, uh, in the continuous uh, regime. And uh, going to the specific, we can have uh, the relativistic particles. Relativistic particles for the Bose-Einstein distribution, we are going to have the, our energy density for the Bose distribution from B is equal to the internal degrees of freedom of our particle. Then we have the Riemann function, which is just a function that gives you a constant once you plug in a number here, okay, over pi square of kT over h bar c to the power of 3. And for the, uh, sorry, sorry, that is the numbers actually, and b. Then we have the energy density, rho b, which is again proportional to the internal degrees of freedom of our particle, pi to the power of 2, of, to the power of 2 divided 30, kT over h bar c to the power of 3, and that to the power of 4. So this is raw, and uh, ah, let me continue here. So we continue with our part. Uh, so we have the number density, we have the number density, we have the energy density, and the pressure, P again for our bosons, is going to be equal to one third and the number density, uh, the energy density rho of boson of this expression. Huh. One third. That's the W. Here, equal to one third that we have in our uh, equation, parametric equation of states. You see, ratio W and the energy density. There is a C square that is relies that is in this energy density. Okay. If we go for the fermions, therefore we are looking at the Fermi Dirac distribution. Again, we have the number density uh, uh, of uh, particles, which is for the Fermi Dirac distribution, and we have a, a threefold factor in front of it. Okay, so F, G, B, and uh, okay. I wrote it in this way. You see that we have uh, the internal degrees of freedom divided GB, so this one cancel. It means that we have three fourths and then this expression. Okay. So it looks like that there is the Bose distribution here, but there is not, it's just canceling out with this term here. Okay, so it's three fourths, that's the factor, GF, and then the very same function. So the very only the only difference is three fourth factor here. Similar thing goes for the energy density distribution for our fermions. Where the factor in this case is 7 8th GF over GB and then EF UB. Okay. And then we get the pressure, which again is one third, so the very same number pops up equal to you. Um, Yeah, to you have. So we again have W equal to one third. The other thing you should notice 
is that this t to the power of 4 that is popping up here. Okay? So this guy is going to be relevant for photons. The rest is going to be relevant for the meta distribution, for the relativistic species, for example, neutrinos. Okay, neutrinos will have an equation of states which is the one of photons. So, neutrinos. Okay, and we have this temperature dependency for the two guys. Okay, yeah. Why is? Where, sorry? You, you, you. You. Ah, sorry. Right. I used the raw before, sorry. Because I have energy density in mind, so that's, uh, that's going to be raw F. Thanks. It's the same thing. In my mind, I have uh, the density, energy density, and I wrote raw, so let's stick to raw. Okay, thanks. Good. Then we have the non relativistic particles. Non relativistic particles, so we have uh, these uh, distinctions. And we have the Maxwell and Boltzmann distribution. We are interested in uh, metal particles, okay? Dark matter and variance and so on and so forth. For the energy, uh, uh, the energy of each particle can also be associated to uh, to the metal distribution and to, to sorry to its uh, uh, mass. And basically, we get the non-relativistic limit. Well, let's put it next to it, where kT is much smaller with respect to mc squared. Okay, that's the limit in which we are considering our non-relativistic particles. In this case, we have, uh, uh, again, maximum Boltzmann distribution, or again, we have a proportionality factor which is related to the internal degrees of freedom. Then we have kT over 2 pi h bar to the power of 3 half e to the minus kT over mc squared. That's the density. For the energy density, uh, rho is equal to 3 half and k and the pressure pressure p is equal to n k t okay once we express the number density with respect to rho it's easy to do that because we just have the mass which is transformed and number density to uh, actual energy density we have k rho over m t look what we have here T over M, uh, our approximation for no relativistic fluids here. And this guy is approximately zero in the non relativistic limit. Okay. What we are going to do is to assume equilibrium where thermal equilibrium, where mu, so the chemical uh, energy up there, mu is equal to zero. Equal to zero. Okay? Why can we do that? The universe is expanding. So we do it even if the expansion factor is growing. So the system is not in mechanical equilibrium. Okay? It's changing. Despite that, we know that the reaction between the different particles, the different species, occurs with a rate which is much larger with respect to the expansion rate. What does it mean? That for as the universe is expanding, yes, it does it, but very slowly, with respect to the speed in which the particles can talk one with each other to re-thermalize. Therefore, you can imagine the universe as a dynamical system is expanding, but always in equilibrium, where the equilibrium is a sort of local, okay? Each expansion rate has its own temperature. So for each 
A, we have a dependency on the temperature. So our temperature is well characterized, is well defined, and we can use all of all of that and plug them in into the into the uh, in our Friedman equations. Okay, so that's it. Bottom line: three species. The scalar field, we are leaving them aside. The first two, the particles, are described by a our uh, by our Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein distribution, it depends on the nature of the particles. We are going to distinguish between relativistic particles for the two distributions. Well, important feature, they both have the same equation of state. Okay? So W is the same for the two. No relativistic particles, well, the pressure is different with respect to what we have here, because pressure is different than zero all the time, because that's equal to one third. Whereas in this case, in the non-relativistic framework, that's behaving like dust. Okay, so this is um, uh, basically, uh, this is uh, uh, why we are treating the matter component of the universe as dust. Okay, that's why the pressure is negligible on the or under these uh, limits. Okay. And as I said, the scalar field, we leave it aside for a moment because it's going to take not much a lot of time. During these lectures. Okay. So, let's give a look now at why we could write uh, the numbers I wrote in the earlier, right? And as numbers, I mean the values of omega variance, omega radiation, and so on and so forth. Where are they coming from? Why are we forced to assume that there is dark matter out there? Okay? Or why the universe is pushing us to believe uh, that? So let's give a look some more details. Let's give a look at the relativistic species As I said, we have photons, that's obvious. Okay, we label with gamma. They are bosons. They have, they are relativistic, obviously. And uh, they have two internal degrees of freedom that are related to the polarization, to the polarization mode. W, as we said, is equal to one third. Using the continuity equation, rho equal to rho, so, so the, the adiabatic conditions that we have seen uh, in the previous lectures, we can define our density, rho, one plus w. So we just plug here our w, one third, and we get our energy density uh, evolution. So we have basically that this is proportional to a to the power of minus four. That's why we have this omega to the power of minus four in the Friedman equations. Then what we have? That we have also that the, uh, that the energy density uh, rho of our photons was proportional to t to the power of four. The universe is expanding, the temperature is going down. And that's what we see from here. Okay, because we can put these two, uh, uh, the proportionality together, and we get that the temperature is proportional to a to the power of minus one. Expressing that in terms of redshift, it goes with one plus zero. Okay, so we can set for z equals zero, that today we have the temperature of our universe. Okay. For a, uh, for a equal to 1. 
uh, at a equal to one, or if you want, or p at the right shift equal to zero. Okay, that's when you see this zero is always nowadays values. What do you see there? What's the only dependency on this quantity, for instance? The temperature. Well, we can measure the temperature of the photons. For example, we have a Kobe or Planck that measure the temperature of the cosmic microwave background with extremely high accuracy. Cosmic microwave background. So there are microwave photons, okay? Photons in a microwave regime. And C of the, T of the CMB, so that the temperature of the photons that is measured at today's time, so this will be our T0, is equal to 2.725. Okay, knowing the values of uh, the constant k that uh, is going to enter here, we basically get a density of the photons today, which is of 4.641, 10 to the minus 34 grams per centimeter cube. Enter 4, the density contrast of our photons, assuming flat geometry, which is defined as rho gamma photons over rho critical, and again, as well as a time zero, <coughs> both of them, is equal to 2.469 10 to the minus 5, h to the minus 5. Yeah. What can I say? Minus 2. Okay, just this measurement. We know how much photons, what is the density of the photons out there. So that's coming from CMB measurements. And the measurement is extremely accurate because we are in front of ourselves a distribution of the photons, which is a perfect black body spectrum with a super well defined temperature T. Okay? Yeah? You can always make the conversion to, of densities to grams with the C square factor. Okay, then we have our uh, neutrinos. The photons, neutrinos, which we symbolize with nu, okay? In this case, we have, they are fermions, therefore we are using the Fermi direct distribution, uh, the, 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 the Fermi um, distribution, fermions. Again, they are relativistic. That because they decoupled from the photons where they were still relativistic. Okay? In contrast to dark matter. When they decoupled from photons, dark matter was already non relativistic. That's why we consider it as a non relativistic fluid. In this case, uh, for the neutrinos, that's not the case. Then we have our uh, degrees of, uh, internal degrees of freedom, which is equal to 1. For these guys, and in the standard model, in equilibrium, mu equal to 0, in the standard model, we have three species of neutrinos. We have the uh, electron neutrinos. We have the muonic neutrinos. And we have the tauonic neutrinos. The tau neutrino. And therefore, we have three species. We can define an effective number of neutrinos, which is equal to three. Now, what do we have? Well, we have again the, the, the Fermi-Dirac distribution for these guys. So we have rho relative to the temperature. 
And even though we never measure the cosmic neutrino background, so the, cos the cosmic neutrino background, Cosmic neutrino because ah, God, C, B. So that's the equivalent of the cosmic neutrino background. So here we have relics which are our photons. In this case, would be our neutrinos. These guys here, we never measure it. Okay? No measure of uh, T, no, of the temperature of the neutrinos. We don't have that. But we can derive our temperatures of the neutrinos coming based on the one of photons, okay? And you can do that if you believe in the behaviors of entropy, okay? As we know, when we had uh, uh, basically at the time at which we have uh, the universe at one mega electron volt. We have the, the electrons and the uh, uh, positrons, the electrons and positrons that are annihilating one with each other, and they're going to give us uh, a sea of photons. Okay, they annihilate each of these two particles are going to give two photons. Again, for energy momentum conservation reasons, we have two photons and not one. And, uh, what happens is that uh, we have the universe is expanding, and therefore the temperature of the neutrinos is going down, right? Sorry, the temperature of the photons is going down. Then we arrive at this time, and what happens? We have uh, that the energy of these two combines, the, co the energy of these two guys combined, is going to give two photons that have uh, an energy which is larger than the, the ground the, uh, of the photons at that time. And therefore, we have in general. It is, a, um, it is a event of annihilation of, uh, uh, of electrons and positrons is going to be larger than the one of the neutrinos that are already decoupled, okay, from photons. T nu, at the time they were the same because there was, this, uh, the electrons were this delta, therefore the weak interaction was possible, was acting on them. They just continue to live their own life, so it is, is going to be to nu, and the temperature of the neutrino is going to be larger because of this event. Okay, so we have this uh, reheating of the photons that occurred at that time. Okay, now we can measure the entropies of uh, uh, photons and neutrinos before these events and the entropy of neutrinos and photons after this event. We have conservation law, and we end up, this we did it in cosmology, that the temperature of the cosmic neutrino background is equal to the temperature of the photon, and there is a factor of 4, 11 to the power of 1 third. Therefore, if we measure the temperature of the photons, that we can do, this we have, we know the temperature of the neutrinos. But if we know the temperature of the neutrinos, we know the density, the energy density of the neutrinos. And effective, 7 pi to the power of 2, then 8 times 13, and then, well, let's write it with terms of, yeah, that's fine, okay, T, nu over h bar c to the power of 3 this is to the power of 4 we plug in our factor of fourth 11 to the power of one third here multiplied to the ten, to the temperature of the neutrinos we know how many neutrinos we have okay and to give you a number, omega relativistic at time zero, which is defined by the, the density of photons at time zero, 
plus density of neutrino at time zero divided the critical density at time zero is equal to eight zero five one ten to the minus five negligible. Okay, now day is negligible. Does it mean that we need to completely ignore photons and uh, of neutrinos across the cosmic history? No, for two different reasons. Because no, log rho log a diagram, photons are going down with a power of minus four, the density. Matter is going to a to the power of minus 3. And then if we believe in the cosmological constant or even dark energy, which cannot be too far from the behavior of the cosmological constant because lambda CDM model is working very well. Therefore, maybe it's not lambda that explain the expansion that we use to explain the expansion of the universe, the accelerated expansion of the universe. But, but uh, it is, uh, uh, the, is dark energy, but in any case, uh, it, it has still to look sort of the cosmological constant, okay? Well, lambda is going to be constant, or if you want dark energy, the density must be roughly constant, okay? With dark energy, we are going to see there is going to be an evolution, but still not far from that, okay? So you see that we have different epochs of domination. But for the early times, yes, today's density is very low because it's poor. The energy density is going down this way. But at the time, it was relevant. It was actually dominant, and it was ruling the expansion of the universe. Then we have a matter domination epoch, in which matter was ruling over the other two species. And then, in the future, we are going to have a lambda, or dark energy dominated epoch, in which the universe is, a, is a, the, the dynamics is entirely defined by the uh, expansion law given by lambda, for example. Okay? Now, we are sort of here. You are here, okay? Where we have that the density of omega m, as I wrote earlier, is roughly 70, 0 0.7, okay, 70%, and 0 0.3, actually, for matter. Hmm. Okay. which for a physicist, they are the same, okay? They are order one. They are both order one. Why? Take lambda, okay? What it has to do with matter? They're completely uncorrelated, okay? One is, is com can be coming from, a from the how gravity is working, okay? That's where it pop up, actually, lambda. We can then throw it into the an energy uh, in energy momentum tensor form, then is associated with vacuum energy. What has to do the vacuum energy with baryons, with dark matter? And then why are they so close one to each other today? Lambda cannot explain that. Okay? That's why people like dark energy, because maybe there is an interplay between dark energy and baryons or dark matter or whatever. Okay? So you can create mechanism in which the energy density of one is following the other one. And you would have dark energy model with scaling uh, behaviors. Okay? The two are kind of the same all over the time. Okay? And then there are other models, tracking models, in which uh, you lead the two to have roughly the same density when you start to have an acceleration taking place. Okay? A little bit of fine tuning is necessary. But at least uh, it gives sort of a physical explanation why we have this sort of uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of coincidence between the two values. Okay. Good. Ah, then the other one, neutrinos. Why are they relevant? Okay. The number density is ruled by photons anyway. The photons are even defining what here, what are the entropy. Uh, properties of our universe. Why then are neutrinos relevant? 
Why are there cosmic structure formation? They are non-relativistic and they tend to free stream. Okay? So if you have an object which is collapsing, right? For example, you have the formation of galaxies or galaxy clusters, they are relativistic species. Therefore, yes, they are collapsing together. I mean, they feel the collapse of the overall structure, but they are relativistic. And these tend to smear down the formation of structures. Therefore, their presence, their existence is extremely relevant. That's why we're going to look into that, these guys as well. Is extremely relevant, not for the dynamic of the universe, but for cosmic structure formation. Okay? It's going to give you what is the uh, maximum size, sorry, the minimum size of the dark matter halos they can form. Okay? It's going to give you a suppression of those. More neutrinos, less small structures. So, more neutrinos, less uh, small structures, and the way around. Okay? We are going to see that. So, that's why we need to track all of these guys. Even if they are not ruling the dynamics of the universe. Okay, so we can have uh, perhaps a little break. We can resume at uh, 10 past midday. And then uh, we will continue with uh, the non-relativistic species to see why we need the dark matter. And after that, we're going to see the real problems of uh, dark energy. I'm going to introduce the dark energy of lambda that uh, I introduced uh, in, the, in the cosmological lecture. So we are going to give a look into that. And we are going to look into a few more details. And uh, tells you also that, yes, you can use dark energy to solve uh, some of those problems, but not entirely. Okay, so some problem is still left. Okay, so at 10 past, uh, uh, sorry, 15 past uh, uh, midday. Escape or computer wasting.
just a fucking um, bro. Что на то извиняется, что мы не спишку на шее.
Thank <laughs> you. 